Time to master diabetes here on the exam room brought to you by the physicians committee with the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. So thrilled now to be joined by an old friend of the program. You know him, Cyrus Kambata, Dr. Cyrus Kambata, I should say. He is one half of the team over at Mastering Diabetes here now to answer your questions all about this disease. Cyrus, how are you doing today, my man? Uh, I am all, I'm doing great and it's always fun to be here with you. So thanks for inviting me back. Oh, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. And we have a lot of great questions coming in today. A lot of right. these are kind of like, it, it seems like these are people who may be new to the idea of eating a plant-based diet, but mm -hmm. they've had diabetes. And so now they're, they've heard some good things and now it's time to answer those questions and fill in those gaps. So you ready, my man? Let's do it. Let's have some fun. All right. Well, the first question comes to us from Sheena. She wants to know, uh, because you and I previously have talked about fat being a real culprit here as opposed to sugar, a lot of fat and coconut meat. So she's wondering when you eat coconut meat or drink coconut juice, do you also get saturated fat or does that only apply when it's uh, processed oil? So coconut oil. Ooh, very, very, very good question. Okay. So let's talk about saturated fat in particular, because it's, uh, you know, Fat is a, uh, it's a complex topic, to be perfectly honest, and I think a lot of it is, uh, is poorly communicated in the world of health. So in order to talk about carbohydrates and fat and protein, we have to be like very, very specific in our language. And if, if you're not, then you run into problems where you sort of get confused and you say, well, this person said this about sugar and this person said this about carbohydrates, and then it becomes confusing. So uh, first things first, um, in the world of let's say in the world of natural health, there's this sort of common misconception that diabetes and insulin resistance um, is caused by eating too much sugar. And so you'll hear this over and over again, that people say, oh, you know, like, don't eat sugar because it raises your risk for prediabetes and type two diabetes. And it raises your risk for uh, obesity, and it raises your risk for fatty liver disease and Alzheimer's disease, right? And the truth is that uh, all that information is correct, as long as you're referring to refined sugar, okay? So you cannot use the word sugar by itself. You got to put the modifier in front of it. You got to say refined sugar, which is white table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, nat, uh, I'm sorry, um, processed sugars that you get from the grocery store that are inside of the packaged products that you're eating and may not even know. Okay. But when you're referring to um, another thing that people say all the time is they say, oh, don't eat fruit because fruit contains sugar. And uh, that right there, as soon as I hear that, I say, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Can't say that, can't say that. Because fruit contains carbohydrates that are whole. So fruit contains whole carbohydrates, and the whole carbohydrates are broken down into molecules of glucose and fructose primarily. So those molecules, the glucose and fructose, are actually fuels for your brain, for your liver, for your muscle tissue. And using the word sugar to describe those foods is technically technically accurate, but it's also very misleading. So instead of using the word sugar, what I like to tell people is no, fruit contains whole sugar or whole carbohydrates. And when you use the words refined sugar and whole carbohydrates, then all of a sudden it starts to become much easier to understand. Same thing is true when it comes to fat. Okay. People say, oh, you know, fat causes obesity, fat causes diabetes. And the truth is that no, 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 no. The consumption of excess fat beyond your physiological requirements uh, is what increases your risk for many chronic diseases, uh, whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart disease, whether it's obesity, whether it's fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's disease, you name it. Okay. So it's not just fat. It's the excess consumption of fat in particular saturated fat. So the question really here is, well, what is saturated fat? Is it only in coconut oil or do I get it from the coconut meat as well? And saturated fat as a, uh, as a, as a species of fat, if you will, um, comes mainly from the animal world. So you get it from red meat, white meat, chicken, fish, uh, eggs, dairy products. That's where most saturated, those products are very high in saturated fat. And then saturated fat is also found in the plant world. It's found in, a, I'm sorry, it's found in uh, avocados, nuts and seeds. Uh, it's found in olives, it's found in coconuts, and it's found in vegetable oils. Okay, truth be told, this is factoid, saturated fat is everywhere. Saturated fat is in lettuce. It's in... This banana contains saturated fat, believe it or not. It's just in such a small quantity that it's not really worth talking about. But the foods that do contain you know, a significant quantity of saturated fat from the plant-based world are, like I said, avocados, nuts and seeds, olives, coconuts, and vegetable oils, okay? So 
if you're taking a coconut and you press the coconut and you turn it into an oil, that's one way that you can consume the coconut. Or you can take the coconut, you can scoop out the meat, and then you can have the coconut meat. Okay. So both of the uh, the ways that you consume this are going to contain a, the same saturated fat content or very similar saturated fat content. Okay. The reason why people gravitate towards coconuts is because you hear this all the time. They say, "Oh, um, coconuts contain a medium chain triglyceride, and it functions different differently than a long chain triglyceride." And this launched this whole product line called MCT oil, medium chain triglyceride oil. And to truth be told, a lot of this is just pure marketing, pure marketing hype. But what I want you guys to understand here is that coconuts absolutely contain saturated fat. It just happens to be a shorter chain length than you would find in chicken or red meat or dairy products. But just because it's a shorter chain length does not give you the green light to go consume large quantities of coconut and put in large quantities of saturated fat into your body on a daily basis because when you do that you increase your overall chronic disease risk and that sets you up for long-term you know problems in the future all right now here's the ultimate follow-up question from meg wondering if sugar isn't the problem are you really saying that a fatty hamburger is healthier than a candy bar oh this is a tough question i've, I've got this before it's like <laughs> it's like what's the lesser of two evils right so I guess we have a, a hamburger that's like a fatty, oily hamburger on one side, and then we have a candy bar on the other side. Um, truth be told, I, I don't know. I don't know which one's worse for you. Um, I, could, I could argue that you know, the candy bar is worse for you. I could argue the hamburger is worse for you. What I will tell you is that the hamburger does present multiple problems. Number one, the hamburger contains a significant amount of saturated fat. Number two, the hamburger contains a significant amount of cholesterol. Number three, the bun on the hamburger is a refined carbohydrate, okay? And so um, the only, you know, nutrients, the only foods of value inside of a hamburger, in my opinion, are the lettuce and onions and tomatoes that go between the bun and the patty, okay? The rest of the, you know, the patty itself plus the, the bun plus, you know, the ketchup and mustard and relish, which are all processed foods, none of those have any valuable nutrient, uh, you know, value. Um, so the hamburger presents multiple problems. We got the saturated fat, we got the refined carbohydrates, plus we also have cholesterol. Um, the candy bar, um, it presents multiple problems as well because candy bars often contain chocolate as an example. So milk chocolate. So boom, now you got yourself saturated fat. Uh, now you got yourself synthetic white sugar without question. And then in addition to that, candy bars often have other sugar, you know, versions of sugar like nougat or caramel or high fructose corn syrup. And these are the things that make them taste really good. So the candy bar just tends to be like more refined from like the sugar area, but it also does contain saturated fat. And then the hamburger presents saturated fat plus cholesterol plus refined carbohydrates. So slice it however you want. You come up with the answer. You know, which one's worse for you? I say they both kind of are not awesome. So if I were in your position, I would eat neither one of them and I would just opt for whole foods from the plant-based world as much as humanly possible. But a, a plant-based burger, I mean, you kind of, you can't go wrong. Some burgers, right? So then let's say the healthier ones, the ones made from beans, as opposed to say maybe the impossible burger or something like that. Bingo. Okay. So when it comes to plant-based burgers, just like you're saying, you, you can go to the store and you can buy a packaged and, and or processed burger that's either an impossible burger or it's a beyond meat burger those are sort of like two name brands that you find these days uh, and those burgers if you actually read the, the the packaging you'll find that there's a whole bunch of synthetic ingredients in them, and they're they're effectively made in a laboratory or you know contain a lot of like synthetic laboratory made ingredients and they just happen to taste incredibly good and they taste like a normal burger would but then you have the other type of burger which is like a homemade burger that you could make by yourself which contains, just like you were saying, black beans, chickpeas, uh, sun-dried tomatoes, zucchini. Um, sometimes I've seen oatmeal put inside of burger patties. So you put together some combination of, again, whole foods. You, you process them in a way that they turn into a patty. You stick it in your oven. You cook them. And then you take that and you put it onto a burger. Or even better, you take a portobello mushroom. You put a little bit of vinegar on that thing. You put it in the oven. You take it out, 
you stick it inside of you know two pieces of whole grain bread now you have yourself a burger right so i would always opt for just like you're hinting at here i would always opt for the whole food version uh, over the synthetic version any day of the week and if you do that then you're going to consistently be improving your health meal by meal that portobello burger sounds like that would hit the spot right about now. I'm not even going to lie to you, man. My stomach is rumbling, Jack. Uh, Charlie, <laughs> he wants to know, what are your thoughts on sugar-free candy that is marketed to people with diabetes? Is that a healthier option? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's a number of reasons why I say absolutely not. Because even though, you know, a lot of this like, uh, this, like sugar-free or low-fat uh, these words that you read on the, the the outside of a package, sometimes they say like, you know, protein rich or like 15 grams of protein, right? It's just, this is marketing. This is pure marketing. And, and food manufacturers know that if they put certain keywords and certain phrases on the front of a bottle or the front of a package, that people will buy them and people will buy them in large quantities. So they do this over and over and over again. And they figure out what are the exact words, what color should the words be in? How big should the words be? Where should they be printed? How does someone's eye look at the package and what are they reading? And they, this is a science. And so they know exactly what to put on the package to, to, to sort of trick you into thinking they're like, oh, hey, this candy, this candy says it's sugar free. That's awesome. I'm going to buy this. And then you go buy it and you're like, well, I'm a diabetic and I'm doing the right healthy thing. Okay. But what they're not telling you is they're not telling you that maybe it's, you know, sugar free. Like how do they define sugar? First of all, cause there's no actual definition for sugar. Are they saying that it's white sugar free? Does it contain high fructose corn syrup? Because some manufacturers don't consider high fructose corn syrup to be a sugar. Does it contain sugar alcohol alcohols like sorbitol or mannitol or, um, erythritol? Okay. Um, these are all questions that you got to ask yourself because there's like many different species of sugar. And until you really like get to the fine print and read the packaging, you're never going to know if there's synthetic, you know, artificial sweeteners inside of your food or not. Okay. So that's the first thing I would say. And then the second thing is that oftentimes, even though something might be sugar free, okay, let's say it's a candy bar and it's sugar free. Um, again, we talked about the fact that it, you know, saturated fat is a problem. Right, so they might actually reduce the artificial sugar content of that food, but in the process they might add more chocolate. Okay, and the chocolate might be made with like cocoa butter, and or real butter, and or margarine, right, and or uh, hydrogenated vegetable oils. And now you're talking about either trans fats or saturated fats, which are known. Like evidence-based research demonstrates clearly that trans fats can cause significant cardiovascular problems. And that saturated fat can be a cardiovascular and diabetes nightmare. So if you're reducing your sugar content, but you're putting more of these other trans and saturated fats inside of the food, are you actually getting healthier? I don't think so. All right. Everybody loves a smoothie. It seems like we can never do one of these Q&A shows without a smoothie coming up one time or another. Linda wants to know whether your blood sugar will rise more if you're drinking a smoothie rather than eating the whole fruit. Yes. So I'm looking down here at this bowl that doesn't look very appetizing at all right now. <laughs> no, this, it doesn't. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. Sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have shown it. This used to be a smoothie. Okay. This used to be a smoothie bowl. and um, the question is, if you consume a smoothie or a smoothie bowl, uh, does that get sort of like processed quicker than if you're eating the whole fruit? And the answer is yes, it absolutely does. Okay. So here's a simple way to think about it. When you're consuming a whole fruit, like let's say you take this banana and you decide to put this banana inside of your mouth. Uh, it's going to take time for this banana to get broken down um, by the enzymes in your digestive system. And then it's going to take more time for those nutrients to be absorbed through the walls of your, your small intestine to get inside of your blood, okay? So I want you to think about whole foods and fruits in this context because we're talking about smoothies as being three-dimensional matrices of nutrients, okay? People, a lot of the time, they think, oh, the banana, it's just, it's just a ball of potassium, right? Not even close, not even close. Whole foods are three-dimensional objects that have vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, phytochemicals, carbohydrate, fat, and protein. 
That is nine classes of nutrients that you find inside of a simple whole food like that. But we don't talk about it that way. People look at an apple and they're like, oh, that apple's, you know, it's high in sugar, right? They take a look at a carrot and they go, oh, that carrot's got, you know, vitamin C in it, right? Or they take a look at an orange, oh, that's vitamin C, right? But the truth is that all whole foods, whether you're talking about a bean or a whole grain or a fruit or a starchy vegetable, every single one of them has all nine of those classes, okay? And it's important to understand that because the carbohydrate, the fat, and the protein are the macronutrients. These are the ones that actually give you energy. So you will, your body can actually turn the carbohydrate, the fat, and the protein into ATP. And ATP is what cells, it's a cellular form of, of energy. It's their currency that they use to, you know, oxidize. I'm sorry, they use to sort of, um, they use that for all of their sort of internal housekeeping and to stay alive, right? Now, um, in addition to the carbohydrate, the fat, and the protein, there's all these other micronutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the fiber, the water, the antioxidants, and the phytochemicals, okay? The fiber is, think of it like rebar, okay? It's literally like the rebar that you would find inside of like a concrete structure, okay? It's this, it's this very complicated mesh that holds the nutrients together. And the nutrients are, again, the carbohydrate, the fat, and the protein, plus all of the micronutrients, the vitamins, the mineral, uh, the water, plus the phytochemicals and the antioxidants, okay? So all of these eight classes of nutrients are locked up inside of this fiber matrix. And that's important because as long as the fiber is present, when you put it in your mouth and it goes into your digestive system, it takes time for your digestive system to get access to those nutrients, okay? You can't break down the fiber and completely uh, degrade it because humans don't have the enzyme called cellulase that's required to break down the cellulose. The, the bacteria inside of your large intestine do. And those are the ones that actually eat the fiber. But what your digestive system can do is it can basically start to what's called denature or like open the, 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 the three-dimensional object so that the other nutrients can, can be degraded and can get chopped up into little pieces and then absorbed into your blood, okay? So I want you to think always about whole foods as literally being three-dimensional objects. And when these three-dimensional objects go inside your digestive system, <clears throat> it requires time for them to be able to, uh, for, for the, the carbohydrate, the fat, and the protein to be able to enter your blood and then get circulated to tissues. And time is your friend. You want things to take a while because when they do, it leads to a slow rise in blood glucose and a slow rise in amino acids, and a slow rise in fatty acids inside of your blood, and that is fine. Now, when you process something, say I took this banana, and I took this banana, and I ran it through a blender, and I turned it into a smoothie, and I added some spinach, and maybe I added some acai berries, and maybe I added some cocoa powder, and I turned it into this beautiful, tasty smoothie. Uh, because I've processed it and I've run it through a blade and the blade has chopped up the components and turned them into like a slurry, from the moment it hits my tongue and goes into my digestive system, my digestive system has to do less work to get access to those nutrients because they're already partially broken down. And so as a result of that, my glucose and or amino acids and or fatty acids are likely to get inside of my blood faster. So if you're, does that mean that you can't ever eat a smoothie? The answer is no, absolutely. I am a huge fan of smoothies, no question. But one of the things I tell people to do is when you're consuming a smoothie, you do two things. Number one, eat it slowly, okay? Drink it slowly. Rather than just taking the whole thing down and wolfing it in like 10 minutes, make it take half an hour, okay? And by doing that, you're slowing down the rate at which these nutrients get inside of your blood. Number two, if you can drink a smoothie and have some, some solid material to come along with it, like some greens, maybe some spinach, maybe some type of celery to go along with it. That will also add fibrous material into your digestive system that'll slow down the rate at which your, uh, those nutrients get inside of your blood. And that's a good thing. Okay? So anything you can do to like keep that rate nice and slow is good. And um, as a result of that, smoothies are a, a go, but try and balance it with either eating it slower or having actual real food to come along with it.
Man, I feel like after that answer, I need one of those graduation caps and I need to flip the tassel to the other side because school is in session. Holy cow, man. That was complex. I love it. That was that was like one of the best answers anybody's given to any question ever on the exam room, man. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. All right. I'm out. I'll see you guys later. My I did here is done. <laughs> total mic drop moment. Too bad we still have at least four questions to go. <laughs> no man, we should have saved that one for last. Oh, my gosh. Uh, golly. Uh, good luck topping that. Um, all right. So we've <laughs> seriously, where do you go from this? Oh my gosh. Uh, all right. Question from Ian. We've talked a lot about fruit. Let's switch over to potatoes. Interesting yeah. one here. Ian writes that he's heard sweet potatoes don't raise blood sugar as much as white potatoes. How could that be when we're talking about a sweet potato? Ah, okay. So there is something that, that very interesting that happens from food to food to food. So you, you read on the internet, it says sweet potatoes are, are better for people with diabetes than white potatoes. Because again, what they're trying to communicate is that the speed at which the glucose molecules get inside of your blood is slower for a sweet potato than it is for a white potato. Um, and then you will also hear people say things like, uh, you know, a sweet potato is a better option for you than is a banana because a banana is going to get inside of your blood quicker. Okay. And the truth is that these, uh, the speed at which foods get like a, a sweet potato versus a white potato, the speed at which those glucose molecules get inside of your blood actually varies from person to person. Okay. So the reason that I'm confident in making that statement is because we have a coaching program. In our coaching program, we are coaching thousands of people uh, through the process of integrating a plant-based diet so that they can become more insulin sensitive, aka they can lower the fat content of their diet, lower the amount of fat that's stored inside of their liver and muscle, and make it so that the, the insulin that their pancreas is producing or the insulin that they inject becomes significantly more powerful and significantly more effective. And that's a good thing because when insulin is powerful in your body, your chronic disease risk drops significantly. So the goal here is target insulin resistance on the head, make yourself insulin sensitive. And as a result of doing that, diabetes tends to fade away and chronic disease tends to fade away. Okay. Now let's go back to the potato. Okay. If you have heard that a sweet potato is better than a white potato that might be helpful information but the truth is that in our coaching program when we teach people how to start integrating potatoes into their diet some people come back to us myself included and they say you know what if i have as little as two bites of a sweet potato good luck glucose through the roof okay if i have as much as two bites of a white potato totally fine glucose very controllable right other people are the exact opposite. They go, oh yeah, I eat a white potato, glucose through the roof. I eat a sweet potato, I eat a purple potato, glucose very controllable, right? So I would love to have a magic wand where I could just take this wand and I could like put it up against someone and I could be like, oh, okay, cool. You should eat white potatoes and you know lower your intake of sweet potatoes because that's what this magic wand tells me. But the truth is that there's a biological individuality from person to person that makes it very hard to predict whether or not this like general advice that sweet is better than white, very hard to interpret, okay? The same type of thing happens from fruit to fruit. Some people find that when they consume bananas, their blood glucose is very controllable and it's not a big deal. And some people find that when they have watermelon, as an example, their glucose goes through the roof and there's nothing they can do to stop it, okay? Other people find the exact opposite. They, they're like, yeah, I can eat a watermelon all day long and everything's fine, but the minute I have an orange, boom, glucose through the roof, right? And I can be the first, I'll be one of the first people to tell you that that individuality from food to food and then the individuality from person to person is a real phenomenon. And as a result of that, what I, you know, unfortunately, what, what I recommend people to do is they have to sort of like start simply and then expand their diet over the course of time in a systematic manner. And, um, we have, you know, many products and services at Mastering Diabetes that are designed to help people go through this process. And we just created this thing called a weekly meal plan, which delivers you 21 recipes in your uh, inbox every single week. And that's exactly what we do is we teach people how to start with a sort of basic co collection of foods, 
and then expand the diversity over the course of time. And in that process, you're going to have to be the detective and you're going to have to figure out if quinoa makes your blood glucose do weird things, but brown rice doesn't, then maybe you should eat more brown rice and a little bit less quinoa, right? So it, there's this sort of like some experimentation which is required, but um, it's a very valuable process to go through because when you really figure it out, then you have a whole menu of foods which you know control your blood glucose well and a menu of foods which tend to be problematic. And I wish I could explain the actual scientific mechanism that explains the bioindividuality from one person to another, but I can't right now. And maybe that'll, that'll be in a future episode. <laughs> Let's do some real talk here for a second. Uh, what you just said is critically important and people do get so frustrated. I've heard this from viewers and listeners of the exam room who say, well, I'm doing everything you guys are talking about and still my cholesterol is high, still my blood sugar is high and my heart goes out to them. And one of the things that I always talk to people specific to weight loss is that there is not a one size fits all program here. And it sounds like the same thing applies for diabetes and a lot of other chronic conditions as well. It, it's about finding what works for you, but don't give up if the first thing doesn't click right into place. I love the way that you term that as far as you need to be your own detective. Absolutely. Like that is huge to me. Don't give up. Just keep digging. Absolutely. And, and you know, and the truth is that when it comes to diet, and understanding what foods might have what positive or negative effects. Like you and I were never taught this in school, right? Nobody goes through a nutrition detective class and walks away understanding how they can test specific foods for their response, either in the short term or the long term. Okay. There are things like a blood glucose meter, which can help out for sure. Um, because it gives you like a real time feedback. There's a, there's, you know, a continuous glucose monitor will do that. An insulin pump can help you understand that information. But if you're not using any of those devices and you're just sort of an average individual who's, you know, medication and device free and you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to lower your cholesterol, it can be challenging because again, we're not equipped with the right tools. And you don't know what information to gather in order to determine whether or not you're doing something right or doing something incorrect. But the general idea here is start simply. Okay. When I say start simply, I mean find seven, maybe 10 foods in the plant based world that you really enjoy eating. Okay. So some of those could be fruits, some of those could be beans, some of those could be whole grains, some of those could be starchy vegetables, some of those could be non-starchy vegetables, doesn't really matter. Let's just say for the sake of argument, my foods were mangoes, papayas, and plantains. I love those foods. I'll eat those all day long. So that's one, two, three. I'm going to add to that chickpeas. I'm going to add to that quinoa. I'm going to add to that broccoli. And then I'm going to add to that... Um, let's do brown lentils and then that's it. Those are my eight foods right there. Okay. So what I would do is I would start constructing foods using some combination of those or start constructing meals using some combination of those foods. And then what I'm looking to learn is how do I feel? How is my energy level? How is my sleep? How is my digestive process? This is a big one. Okay. If every time I eat a meal that contains lentils, I discover that the next morning I have stomach pain and maybe I felt gassy while I was sleeping, then you got to have to be a detective and be like, wait a minute, let me go backwards in time and figure out what did I do and what am I doing consistently that's giving me that same process? Oh, okay. It's probably the lentils. So then the next thing you do, you pull the lentils out and then you have that same meal without the lentils in them. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, the problem went away. So that's a good indicator that the lentils might be causing a problem. If that's the case, Take the lentils out and substitute them with something else. Put black beans there instead, right? So there's a little bit of like a, a detective process, which is required. But the idea here is if you start with a small number of variables and then you increase the diversity over the course of time, if you add foods in one by one, that enables you to better understand and better identify things that could be causing you problems. 
I'll be the first person to tell you that I've gone through this process for the last 18 years. And there are certain foods that I just literally cannot eat because they'll either cause my blood glucose to go extremely high or I just can't digest them properly. And you know what? That's okay. It's not a big deal. So what I do is I don't worry about those foods. And instead, I focus on the foods that I can eat. And I eat those foods in abundance. And I'm a happy camper. You don't feel restricted at all? Like, uh, I, I really wish I could eat that slice of vegan pizza right now. But I know that it's just not going to be any good for me. Uh, the way that I kind of look at that is that, well, yeah, that's one food that you can't eat. But there are 18 bazillion others that you can readily enjoy. Totally. I, I flip it around every single time. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm human. When somebody's sitting down and they're eating a vegan pizza and it tastes really good and it's got barbecue sauce all over it, like they're, they're definitely, there's a part of my brain which is like, oh my God, I don't want to eat that. I don't want to eat that. <laughs> right? But there's a funny thing that happens inside of you know your brain and your digestive system because the two of them are talking all, uh, at all times. So let's say you're sitting down and you, you see this vegan pizza and it looks really good and it smells really good. It just came out of the oven. And your friends and family are about to eat it. And you're just like, wow, God, I want to eat that thing so badly. Okay. So let's just suppose that you went and you ate that food and you were like, all right, I'm just going to have a slice or I'm going to have two slices. So you eat that. It's got, it's got the crust, right? Which is a refined carbohydrate most likely. And then it's got a bunch of vegetables on top of it. It's got a barbecue sauce, which who knows what's in that barbecue sauce. You eat that food and temporarily you're like, man, that hit the spot. That was great. I really, I really enjoyed that process, right? But then two hours later, you recognize you're like, uh, hold on a second, I gotta go to the bathroom. You go to the bathroom, not a fun experience, right? Next morning you wake up and all of a sudden you're just like, man, I feel sluggish. Ugh, that didn't really feel that good, right? If you go through that process once, twice, three times, four times, five times, who knows how many times it'll take you, but there comes a point at which when you repeat that behavior the next time and you have that pizza again or something similar, and then you get that frustrating digestive process, there will come a point where your brain flips and basically says, you know what? It's tasty, but it doesn't do good things to me. And as a result of that, you are likely to not want to eat that food the third time it shows up or the fifth time it shows up. And so there's this feedback mechanism that happens with your peripheral tissues and your central nervous system. And if you can get in tune with that feedback mechanism, then you start to make decisions that are actually subconscious where you don't even have to think about it. And every time that pizza appears, it's not like you're having a fight with it being like, oh my God. I really want to eat that thing. I really want to eat that thing. And you just, you, you see the pizza and you're just sort of like, all right, that's not Cyrus food. That's not Cyrus food. I'm going to focus on this plate of mangoes and garbanzo beans with passion fruit on top of it. And I'm going to enjoy the heck out of this thing. And I could care less about that pizza because this thing is going to work for me digestively. It's going to help me control my blood glucose. It's going to keep my cholesterol low. It's going to give me a lot of energy. I'm going to be able to sleep like a million bucks. I'm going to be able to exercise as much as I want. I'm a happy camper. It took me 27 years to learn that lesson. 27 years, man. But eventually you, you're right. The brain just, it flips and that is a glorious day. Um, question yeah. from Kiana. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, ooh, this is a really good one. A lot of people can probably use this one. Diabetes runs in my family. My mom, my grandma, my dad, and my brothers all have it. And I feel like I'm just biding time until I too have diabetes. How big of a role does genetics actually play in terms of a person's risk of developing it? See what's right there? It's that big. It's that important. Literally that important. Okay? It, I, I don't want to. I don't want to um, make things uh, hard to understand here. I don't. I don't want to mislead and misrepresent the actual biology. There is such a thing as a genetic predisposition towards autoimmune diabetes, which is what I have, type one and then autoimmune type 1.5 diabetes. Meaning, if you have a family member that is living with an autoimmune version of diabetes, your chances of developing it are increased versus the general population. No questions asked. It could be a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, an uncle, a grandfather, a grandmother, you name it, okay? Um, there's also people who are worried, just like Kiana is saying, that, you know, oh, you know, type 2 diabetes, that runs in my family. My mom had it, my dad had it. My grandfather had it, my sister has it, and my brother has it. So therefore, I'm a ticking time bomb, right? 
the truth is that when it comes to prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and gestational diabetes, the, the genetic predisposition that you may have is about this important because you can control your level of insulin resistance, which is the underlying condition that increases your risk for all three of those conditions. You can control insulin resistance every single time you open your mouth. You can fuel insulin resistance by eating the foods I was describing earlier, the saturated fat, the cholesterol, and the refined carbohydrates. Go for it. You eat those foods, insulin resistance will get high, it'll stay high, and as a result of that, your risk for all of these lifestyle versions of diabetes, whether it's prediabetes, type 2, or gestational, goes up. No questions asked. But if you choose to do the opposite, which is eat lower amounts of cholesterol or none, lower amounts of saturated fat, and lower refined carbohydrates or none, if you choose to do that, then what you're doing is you're taking an insulin-resistant state and you're lowering it so that you can become, you can either reverse insulin resistance altogether or you can become extremely insulin sensitive. There's sort of two different ways of explaining it. When you do that, when you reverse insulin resistance, you're literally dramatically lowering your risk for prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. We see this in our coaching program literally every single day of the week. This is the system that Robbie, my co-founder, and I have developed over the course of the last 15 years. It's grounded in 100 years of evidence-based science, and we have practiced it with almost 10,000 people at this point. And I can be the first person to tell you that when you eat to maximize your insulin sensitivity, your genetics are literally this important and it doesn't matter anymore. It literally doesn't matter. So we've had people who have come through our coaching program and they are like, oh, Cyrus, like the odds are against me. You're like, I'm 120 pounds overweight and diabetes is in seven of my family members. And I say to them, I don't really care. I mean, I'm not trying to be insensitive here, but that doesn't really matter, okay? The cards are not stacked against you. All you have to do is learn how to eat and learn how to be consistent and integrate tools such as low-fat, plant-based, whole food nutrition, intermittent fasting when necessary, and daily movement. And you do those three things, and you just watch as your risk for diabetes or your pre-existing diabetes vaporizes and just is, is gone, right? We see that in 80 to 90% of all cases, and I really want people to understand that like your genetics are important, but your diet is way more important every single time. Big shout out to Dick, who's checking us out from Toronto today. He wants to know, oh boy, this is a not a one-on-one question. This is at least 201, maybe even 301. Here we go. We haven't talked about intromyocellular lipid here yet. Uh, how can fat get trapped in a muscle? I thought it hung out just below the skin. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get nerdy. Boom. Here we go. Nerdy. Intramyocellular lipid. I-M-C-L. Okay. Um, this is not a shameless plug. We wrote a book. It's called Mastering Diabetes right here. You can see this right here. Okay. This book came out a year ago. Um, this book has 800 scientific references in it, and it tells you the ins and outs of how you can become the most insulin sensitive you've ever become. A very large portion of that story is all about intramyocellular fat, intramyocellular lipid, otherwise known as IMCL. Okay. Let me tell you a quick story. When you put fat into your mouth, saturated fat in particular, okay, you're eating chicken, you're eating fish, you're eating uh, bacon, okay, or you're eating, you know, a significant amount of nuts and seeds and avocados and coconuts, okay? If you're eating a large quantity of those foods, the fat ends up traveling down your esophagus, it gets inside of your stomach, it gets to your small intestine. Inside of your small intestine, it's acted upon by a whole collection of enzymes. And these enzymes are designed to take the triglyceride molecule, because that's how it exists in nature, and break it apart such that you have the glycerol backbone and the three fatty acids, again, the triglyceroid, the triglycerol, and break it apart. And when it does that, now these three fatty acids can become absorbed into your blood. So these three fatty acids are absorbed into your blood. They're put into these little spaceships called chylomicrons. These chylomicrons circulate. They go all throughout your, your circulatory system. Now, these chylomicrons have one objective, and their objective is to deliver cholesterol and fatty acids into tissues. That's what, they're, that's what they're designed to do. The question becomes, where? Where are they going to put them? Are they going to put the cholesterol and fatty acids in your brain? 
They're going to put in your thyroid. They're going to put in your fat, your muscle, your liver, your kidney, your heart, your sexual organs. Where they, where's it going to go? And the truth is that all of these tissues, with the exception of your brain, are capable of taking up fatty acids and cholesterol from these chylomicron particles. Now, fun fact. If these chylomicron particles were to deliver fatty acids to your adipose tissue and only your adipose tissue, then diabetes would not be a very important pro uh, condition in today's world. Okay? Diabetes would be a, a chronic disease, but it would be very, very small, and it wouldn't really impact a significant portion of the population. But what ends up happening is that these chylomicron particles, they deliver fatty acids into your adipose tissue. And then in addition to that, they also deliver fatty acids inside into your liver and into your muscle. Now, the problem is that your liver and muscle are two tissues which are designed to operate primarily off of glucose. When I say primarily off of glucose, I mean their enzymatic machinery and the entire cellular architecture is built upon the foundation of glucose as a fuel. And there is a small section of the cellular architecture that is mechanically and enzymatically designed to be able to take in fatty acids and either store those fatty acids or take them in and then oxidize them and turn them into ATP, okay? It's just that the majority of the cellular architecture is designed for glucose and a small amount is designed for fatty acids. So what that means is that if you're, if you're eating a saturated fat rich diet for breakfast and lunch and dinner today and tomorrow and the next day and so on and so forth, Within a short period of time, you end up overwhelming your liver and muscle with too much saturated fat. And in that situation, your liver and muscle go into a self-defense mechanism because they're like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. We, we can't handle all the saturated fat. So what they do is they try and find a way to block more saturated fat from coming in. So they, they, they initiate what's called insulin resistance. They stop communicating with insulin as effectively. So what that means is that the next time you eat something that contains carbohydrate, you pick up this banana and you eat it. What happens is that the carbohydrate, the, the, the carbohydrate molecules are broken down into glucose. The glucose is now in your circulatory system. The glucose is trying to get inside of your liver and trying to get inside of your muscle because that's where it belongs. And insulin comes and goes, knock, knock. Hey, liver, hey, muscle, there's some glucose inside of the tissue, inside of the blood. Do you want it? And your liver and muscle go, no, no, no. Remember, I'm doing insulin resistance right now. I'm in doing insulin rejection. I'm not paying attention to you, insulin. I am in self-defense mode. See you later. So insulin literally becomes so ineffective that insulin cannot get glucose inside of the tissues. And as a result of that, glucose and insulin accumulate inside of your blood. So what that means is that people who are eating low-carbohydrate diets or saturated fat-rich diets eat one fruit, one fruit, and their glucose goes through the roof. And their conclusion is, I told, it's the fruit. The fruit's bad for me. I shouldn't eat that fruit. But in reality, the answer is, no, no, it's not the fruit. It's the metabolic traffic jam that occurred before you consumed that fruit that made it so that you, your, your tissue, your, your liver and muscle were not responsive to insulin. That's the problem. So to answer the, pre the question is, you know, what about these IMCL? IMCL, intramyocellular lipid, is just a fancy scientific word for excess fat, excess saturated fat inside of your muscle. That's all it is. And now that you know the story of insulin resistance, you know exactly how this cascade unfolds. And if you can lower your IMCL content by lowering your fat intake, all of a sudden you become insulin responsive and the world is your oyster. There you go, man. That's We're going to move that tassel to the other side again. You're on a roll today. <laughs> you are on a roll today, Professor Kambata. Uh, time for one final question. And I love this one more than any other that we've had on the show today because it offers both inspiration and hope to people who think that they're in a hopeless situation. Shelby wrote in, wants to know how much improvement can somebody see if they've had diabetes for 25 years or longer? Phenomenal question. Uh, the answer is um, in order to fully understand, uh, in order to, be, to definitively answer your question, I would recommend you get one test done first. And that one test is called a C-peptide test. A C-peptide test is a test that will tell us how effective or how much insulin your beta cells in your pancreas are capable of producing, okay? So if you went and got a C-peptide test, it's a very easy test that you can get. You can call your doctor and say, hey, can I get a C-peptide test? They can order it. 
and you can get it done. It's just a simple blood test. Uh, if you get that C-peptide test and it comes back as a low, right, meaning your C-peptide is low, what that means is that the ability of your beta cells to secrete insulin is low. And that right there is an indicator that diabetes is going to be hard to fully reverse inside of you without the use of insulin. If you go get your C-peptide tested and your answer is medium, what that means is that you can definitely reverse uh, diabetes and insulin resistance using your diet, but that you're going to have to be pretty darn diligent about it. Okay, and then when I say diligent, I mean consistent and uh, no wavering, no cheat days, no no messing around. Okay, if you go get your C-peptide measurement and you come back with a high result, what that means is that you you can easily reverse insulin resistance and diabetes using a low fat plant based whole food diet because your pancreas is secreting a sufficient amount of insulin. Now, statistically speaking, I don't know the actual number, but if I had to hazard a guess, what I would say is that about 20% of the diabetes population, of the type 2 diabetes population, has a low C peptide level and therefore is going to require insulin over the course of time. The other 80%, okay, the, the majority of people living with type 2 diabetes have either a medium or high C peptide value. And as a result of that, diet is sufficient. So get that test, figure out what your level is, and then based off of that level, you can use that as a compass to try and figure out, do I need diet plus insulin or can I just do diet alone? And if, again, this, the, the odds are in your favor that you can do it for your diet alone, but the C-peptide test just tends to be very helpful in understanding that process. All right. A little bit earlier in the show, you mentioned that uh, you had just developed a weekly meal plan. And I need to know, my man, before I let you go, what kind of food is on there? Give me an idea of what's on this menu. Make my mouth water. Here is your opportunity. Go. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. So we have received an overwhelming number of messages from people who are living with diabetes around the world who have been telling us like, hey, guys, your information is awesome. But here's the thing. I just need to know what to eat. Tell, literally tell me what to make. Tell me what to buy at the grocery store. Tell me what to make and I'll do it. So what we did was we developed a weekly meal plan, which is literally a, uh, a collection of recipes. You get 21 recipes per week delivered directly to your email inbox. And every week you get a whole new collection of recipes. And these recipes are delicious, if I don't mind saying so myself. Okay, We put a lot of work into these recipes. These recipes are made primarily of every single fruit you can possibly think of and buy in the grocery store. We are very fruit friendly. Uh, starchy vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes and purple potatoes and squash. And I will put corn into that category because it tends to be starchy. Also, uh, you can do whole grains like quinoa and brown rice and millet and farro and the like. And then we also have legumes like beans, lentils, and peas. Okay, So we, we focus on those four food groups. Fruits, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And practically every meal is built around that. And then there's a whole bunch of other things that come in for fun. You know, green leafy vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, a little bit of nuts and seeds here and there, some avocados here and there. And we put together these very, very tasty meals so that all you have to do literally is look at the grocery shopping list and be like, all right, I'm just going to go buy this stuff. You go to the grocery store, you buy it, you bring it home, you follow the instructions, and now you have yourself something that's extremely delicious something that's very nutritious, and something that is designed to keep your blood glucose very controllable as you reverse insulin resistance and become the most insulin sensitive you've ever become. So if you're inter if anybody's interested in this, you can just go to the masteringdiabetes.org website and uh, go masteringdiabetes.org slash meal plan. Take a look at it. If you're interested, go for it. If you're not interested, no problem. Dude, that is fantastic. I'm going to go take a look at that. I want to get my hands on some of those recipes for sure. Cyrus Kambata, PhD, you are the man to me. Thank you so very much for joining us, my man. Chuck, I totally appreciate you allowing me to be here today. And uh, I hope we answered a lot of really good questions here about diabetes. I hope people are uh, you know, enjoy this content. Oh, my man, you definitely raised some nutrition IQs today. Very well done, my friend. <laughs> Thank you.
If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.